to transition uh, to Facebook and some of the other platforms so we can do our live moderated discussion. Um, again, I wanna remind you if you wanna see this short film again, which is so powerful, um, you can do that on Netflix. Uh, and uh, it came out on Netflix last month. Um, and obviously a lot of the themes in this um, about systemic racism, about inequality, all of those things are things we're grappling with now and I'm hoping we can talk about it on this panel to come. Um, and as soon as we have uh, our panelists, we will open it up for that. But yeah, I mean, one of the things, I don't know, you know, of you out there watching, how many of you have been to this region, but the difficulties in, you know, making it around, particularly if you're Palestinian, are, are clearly apparent here. Um, okay, so MPAC, I guess you are going to give me the A-OK -okay when I can introduce the panelists. <laughs> and I'm assuming we can We do are that. live, we're live, Lorraine. Alrighty. All right, so I would like to uh, introduce our panelists here. Um, and first off, I would like to introduce uh, Farah Nabosi, who is the director, executive producer, and co-writer of, of the present. Congratulations, Farah. Huge victory, beautiful film. Um, next up is Mahana Nalas, who is executive producer. And I'd also like to introduce Salah Bakri, who is lead actor in the present. He played Yusuf. Incredible job. Uh, I'd also like to interview, introduce um, Dr. Yusuf Salam. He is prison reform activist, motivational speaker, justice seeker, and you will know him as a member of the Exonerated Five. Hello, Dr. Yusuf Salam. And last but not least, uh, Tarek Ben Amar, film and media entrepreneur. And thank you all so much for being here. Um, if you wanna unmute, um, that'd be great and we can just jump right in. Perfect. First off, uh, I just wanna say congratulations on the BAFTA win for this film and ask you, uh, Farah, Salah and Mohaned, what is this, mean to you in terms of what the film does, who it reaches, where it goes, the recognition, what does this mean right now to you? The BAFTA? Yes. Or, oh, okay. Well, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I, it's just another elevation of a film that seems to be resonating with people far and wide. Um, and so you, 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 you make a film because you, you're compelled to make the film, at least for me. Um, and, and it's the kind of art that you want audiences to see. It's, it's not a very private art. Some people, for example, can paint or sculpt and not necessarily want it for audiences. With film, for me, it's for me and for audiences. And so really you make that film because you want it to be seen. And when it gets these kind of accolades and recognition, it just means that more and more people are going to see it or are seeing it. Um, so for me, it's just, it's the exposure. And of course it's an honor. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to have your work recognized and, and um, appreciated. And, uh, but, uh, but for me personally, it's, it's about having your art seen far and wide. That's, that's for me. If, if you want me to, to uh, jump in here, I'm not sure the order you should yeah. want to ask us, so I'll you know, ju jump in and, and until ahead. you tell me otherwise, you, you know, I'm one of those people who are not shy, so, so shut me up when it's time to do so. Uh, but essentially, look, I mean, from my end, clearly, as Farah says, this now is elevated to, uh, to a worldwide audience. And to me, uh, uh, it, it just makes me feel so hopeful for, for the future of what's happening to the Palestinians. Uh, the Palestinians have such a, a, a terrible card dealt for them that has been going for so many years. Everybody talks about the great democracy that Israel is, which it is. And I mean, evidenced by their third or fourth election that is ongoing right now. But the idea is it is this particular democracy that is allowing this to happen. 
and sets a blind eye and not only sets a blind eye, but encourages the settlements and increases this, which is turning into an apartheid system where roads can be used by some and not by others. So to me, it's, it's being able to tell that story where it's not, people say, oh, it's the only democracy in the Middle East and to brag about it. Well, yes, but there's some great atrocities that were done in the world by democracies as well. So doing a bland eye on that is not appropriate and telling that story that Farah has done so brilliantly and Saleh played that role of thousands upon thousands and actually millions of Palestinians that live under the system that have to accept the humiliation day in and day out in front of their children. So it means a lot to so many. And Salah? Yeah, adding to what uh, uh, both uh, Mohammed and Farah said, um, I would say that, yes, it is, it, it strengthen my optimist. I have two, you know, pessimist and optimist inside me, and they are keep fighting here in, uh, in this place. There is a, a very constant fight between the pessimist and the and the optimist inside me and the BAFTAs, uh, the Buff, the BAFTA prize is, is uh, another hit on the head on the head of the pessimist, uh, and maybe he'll sleep for two three days, and he'll wake up again because the situation won't change in the close future because of a film. I know that. But at least for one, two days, he'll go, he'll gone, he'll be gone, and I'll be resting. Well, Yusuf, I wanted to ask you, so for those who aren't familiar with your background, um, you were wrongfully convicted um, for the Central Park Jagger case. Um, and I don't want to tell your story, but just to encapsulate it, spent something like 15 years in prison until exonerated. Um, when They See Us was a production that had raised awareness about your plight and about what had happened. And I just wondered if you could talk about the importance of shining a light on these areas of injustice, inequality, um, through film and through television, like how important is that? I think it's of the utmost importance. You know, I always think about things in what I would call a New York Minute. And in a New York Minute, especially in today's world where we microwave everything and we want things instantaneously, this film in particular gives us an opportunity to address some very, very um, powerful ills in the world but also gives us the opportunity to see a way forward. You know, I often think about the child in the film as, you know, she's, as she's there with her father going through the checkpoint, she's looking out at the uh, Jews who are able to easily go back and forth, you know, not have any kind of issues. They're in their own vehicles. They're in, so to speak, luxury as compared to the rest of the people in that, that, that part of the world, the Palestinians, you know. And that juxtaposition is a juxtaposition that we find ourselves in all over the world. You know, in America, we call it the two Americas, one where you have um, every opportunity afforded to you under the law if you have what they call the complexion for acceptance. But if you have the complexion for rejection, you know, you have to prove yourself innocent in a system that says you're innocent until proven guilty but they see you as guilty because of the color of your skin and not the content of your character. You know, it's the idea of the duality um, also in, 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 in human beings, right? We have to traverse this, this uh, fine line and try to figure out a way forward because we still have to live the life that we've been given. And unfortunately, many of the oppressed people in the world have been given lemons. And the great thing about being given lemons is that we still get an opportunity to make some lemonade. And um, Tarek, I wanted to ask you, because you've had such a long career um, working in films and putting films out there that have, you know, been 
in this region and that have been dealing with either the Middle East or North Africa, when you're watching the present, is this the first time you've seen it? <laughs> I'm assuming not. But you know, what is your reaction to it? How did you feel about it? What is it? What does it bring up for you as someone who has a long history in making films from this area? First of all, what Yusuf just said about the lemon and the lemonade—it's a very powerful um, way to, and of course, the portrayal of films are are essential. Look, look you, you reach people's brain through the heart, and that's what the present does, right? Whatever the story, whatever the injustice in the world, uh, the media of film has given us some great lessons. If you look at all film history, let's go back to the topic I'm very close to, racism in America and racism elsewhere. Um, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird, that book and that movie, I was a young man, I was a young Tunisian uh, North African in an American school. I immediately connected with the uh, civil rights movement. And then I was lucky to have met in Washington, D.C., the Black Panthers and Stokely Carmichael, all that world. And making movies through the heart. Um, in fact, I had a question for, uh, uh, for uh, and, and Farah did exactly that. She she didn't make a political pamphlet, a panel where we can have discussions and all kinds of scholars can come. If, if she has won the battle of reaching those few thousands of people, because thanks to social media, we get, we get access. If all of a sudden people who have no idea what Israel and Palestine issue is, and everybody thinks it's Arabs against Jews, right? It's a religious war, which it isn't. It's been manipulated by religious people on both sides. Uh, religion has become a political party, but you p get, get people in the heart and then maybe you start creating an awareness of the injustice. Um, I wouldn't want to have the Palestinians wait 400 years like the, my uh, African-American brothers who are still fighting the injustice and Yusuf is a, paid his own big chunk of his life to that injustice. And we see it every day. We're in the middle of the George Floyd trial now. Will we have, will have we learned something? I don't know. Will America have woken up? Yusuf can maybe answer that certainly for sure better than I, but we should continue. There is no small, small movie, you know, Far is not a filmmaker. She didn't do it to make a statement. She didn't do it to win the Oscar. She didn't do it. I don't know. I'm speaking for her. I'm sure she can uh, to win the BAFTA. That is the reward of her passion and, uh, you know, her background. Uh, she comes from banking. But, so all of a sudden she's not in that world that is typical filmmakers. Salah is an actor. He told us earlier in the panel that, you know, he deals with culture. He, he doesn't want to deal with politics. And he's right, you know, we, we, we should stay in our world. Uh, I, as a producer, uh, have to make films that mean something to the communities in which we live in, all right? So we, each of us have, has to contribute. And this is a very important step that Farah and the backers and Mohammed and all the investors that helped and you, Lorraine, helping getting it out and Sue, in her defense of the image of, of, of Arabs and Muslims um, that has been so terribly portrayed in Hollywood and yeah, elsewhere. Thank you. I mean, and those are great points. And I like bringing it back to Farah, what, you know, because as Tark just said, you actually came from the corporate world at one point and you kind of switched careers and which brings it back to why do this film and how did you do it? I'm so interested to know how you shot this film, where, what were some of the challenges? Um, I'm sure you have some amazing stories, Ansela, you know, of what it looked like to make this. Okay, so first of all, I just want to, uh, Tariq, follow up with this idea. When you make a film from your heart, it is received with other people's heart. It emanates at the film. And certainly this film was made truly from my heart and beyond me. And I think that that is what resonates in the film. 
Um, I just want to touch on Mahanad's point much earlier. I disagree. I don't think it's a democracy. I think it's an ethnocracy. And that's a whole other conversation for another time. But, you know. Um, so filming, but making this film, I mean, you know, I jumped in the deep end. That's it. I decided I wanted to direct. And it's tough making a film no matter what, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're chasing the light, you've got budgets to deal with and, and the stress and uh, timing and all of it. And then to choose to then film in what is essentially militarily occupied territory is just adding another cloud of, of, of pressure and stress. Uh, but of course, you know, when I knew I had the opportunity to film in Palestine, I jumped at it I, without question. Uh, the authenticity, the set backdrops, the actors, the accents, the, the all of it, it just, it made absolute sense. Uh, the topography as well of all of it. Um, and, you know, you just make wise decisions of, of where you're going to shoot. For example, um, I found locations I absolutely loved that were in zones, areas B and C. I don't know if everybody on this um, event knows this, but the West Bank has been chopped up into areas A, B, and C by the Israeli military, and areas B and C are much, you're much more under the, the Israeli military's control, of course all of it is, but those areas more so, there are more checkpoints there, more settlements and uh, illegal settlements there. So I would find great locations that were in areas C, for example. I, I had to abandon them. We ended up in locations that were much more noisy than I wanted, um, more traffic. You surrender to it, you, you accept it. Um, scene two of the film is a real checkpoint. So that scene you all saw with hundreds, thousands of Palestinians from you know three in the morning all the way to sort of seven in the morning is, is documentary. Uh, uh, Saleh Bekri is the only fiction, uh, the, the character of Yusuf that we placed amongst uh, thousands of Palestinians going to work in an infamous checkpoint in, in Bethlehem called Checkpoint 300. And that was tough. That was extremely tough. And I know, I know Saleh can speak to that as well. Um, Guerrilla style, two camera people, um, no lighting. Uh, I'm a blondish female, you know, coming out, directing and hiding behind a wall again. The military were around the corner. We, we knew how far we could go before we came into their sort of line of vision. Um, and then we constructed the other checkpoint and again, chose to do it in, a, in area A um, where we had a lot more control. We knew we hopefully would not be stopped or have anything confiscated, which can happen of course, but you're wise in those decisions. What did happen is that the local Palestinian community surrounding that constructed checkpoint actually thought a real Israeli checkpoint had been set up. And, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it, that, that broke my heart. Uh, and we, we kind of, I was, you know, horrified actually. Um, they were very distressed and we sent people out and I said, please tell them it's not, it's not, it's not. But I was very pleased that it was a very authentic checkpoint that the indigenous people, you know, believed it was real. Um, and there's all sorts of stories I can go into that, you know, uh, whether it's delays because of, you know, various things. But um, overall, I would say that I am so pleased that we, we, we did shoot there, that we did take those chances. And overall, with the help of a wonderful team and optimism versus pessimism, we managed to get it done. And, uh, and here we are. And Salah, you had a story, um, I think about like what the reaction of some of the locals was when you were shooting. Um, I think you had talked about it in a previous interview, something to the effect of like, you know, what's the point? It was, it was almost pessimism. What's the point of doing this? Like the whole world knows what's going on and nothing's happened. With, am I putting words into your mouth or? No, no, no. Um... The opposite. We are talking about this. Uh, Farah was talking about this uh, um, checkpoint that we shoot in, and uh, some some of the people in, in this checkpoint uh, said it loudly. Uh, keep on doing this uh, cinema that doesn't change nothing. Keep on 
taking us in camera, shooting us in camera that has no impact on nothing. And we are, we are still here since then, since uh, the occupation started. So, so nothing changed, camera and cinema and for these people who are tomorrow, three o'clock in the morning, they will be there going to work. We will be in the Oscar while these people will continue going to that checkpoint to get to work and then come back and bring some food to the frigidaire that doesn't work at home. So, so I was speaking that because of, I said also that, 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 that the drama in life in Palestine is much bigger than any drama that we can do. It doesn't anymore, people are not anymore curious about it. Mm -hmm. They fed off cameras. They have been shooting them with cameras and, and other weapons since the first intifada and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing changed, the opposite. The occupation became worse and worse and worse and still going worse. Uh, so that and and that makes the the work, our work, more difficult because people around us, generally speaking, of course, are not curious about it. So there is always a noise. There is always a chaos. Yeah, there are of course people who are curious, maybe younger generation are curious about what you're doing. But generally speaking, no. Once we've been shooting a film in, in Nablus, in Nablus and, uh, and we've been with the, we got uh, like a, a military, Israeli military Jeep, uh, like um, the, the, from the art. And they started to throw stones on the jeep. Wow. They knew this is a film. They knew we are shooting a film, but they didn't care. They just wanted to throw stones on the jeep because this jeep mustn't go on there. You know, it's just a, a symbol of all their misery. Wow. So they had to, sh to, to throw stones on the jeep and they destroyed that jeep. We couldn't shoot with wow. that jeep. Wow. wow. Could I say something though? In 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 our defense, and by that I mean directing a film, defense, you know, Salah, I think so many of the people at that checkpoint are used to news cameras. Um uh, you know, uh, journalist cameras, um, not necessarily uh, coming for cinema. Um, I, I've watched so many, you know, Palestine related films and that checkpoint does not necessarily feature in, in cinema. And I think that there is a difference. There is a difference, that, you know, and they don't, they don't know the difference. Of course, a camera is a camera to them. But in terms of what we did with that footage, we did something very different. They weren't numbers. It wasn't a news. It was Yusuf that was re represented. And they are Yusuf. All those men in that queue are Yusufs. So I, I feel that it took a very different tone. They, they don't know, of course, and they, to them, that was a camera. But in terms of where our work is going, it's very different, I think, to what they think or thought we were doing there, if you get my meaning. Um, yes, so. I, I, I know, I know. And I know that cinema doesn't exist almost in the West Bank since 1987, the beginning of the first intifada. All cinemas were shut down. So people has no access anymore to a cinema. Wow. Since 1987. Wow. But, you know, the, the difference in, you know, th that's like when you're saying the pessimist and the optimist, the shift that's happening here, and we, like when, when I mentioned when they see us, the, the shift that happens between something being covered on the news and by the media. And then when the storytelling and the narration happens 
and it's flipped around by someone like Ava DuVernay or somebody taking the story and we get to tell our own stories, right? And so Yusuf, I saw you nodding when you were, you know, when you were listening to Sala talking about this, it's like, it's like, uh, how do I say this? Everything's invisible when it starts, when it's the media and pounding the same message over and over again. But all of a sudden when that same story is told from a different angle, which is what the present does, I feel like it opens up this entirely different scope and people do become interested again. I don't know, maybe I'm painting a rosy picture on it, but it does seem that way. I think it does. I think that this is a seed and in the seeds that will blossom in the future, you know, we have the great opportunity to participate in that change now, right? Because I forget who said it, but somebody uh, said that the imagination is the precursor of what's to come. And so if you can imagine a reality, if you can imagine a future that is alive and well, as opposed to alive and sick, then you have the ultimate opportunity to participate in that in the greatest way by the artistry that you choose to use, right? We can do, you know, you can think about it, like people can do anything with their time, but to take a moment of time and utilize it to plant a seed, like a rose growing from the concrete, is a beautiful thing. You know, it gives people the opportunity to see you for the very first time in a way that they may not have seen you before. I remember in a previous interview and conversation we were talking about that people had this this idea that the occupation had something to do with people's jobs, you know, how it was such a disconnect in the, in the global uh, mind that this is what's going on there. The same thing that we may call racism in America, the same duality that we have in America is, is similar across the world, which gives me the um, mindset to say that we are not fighting against people against people's color, the skin color. We're fighting against spiritual wickedness in high and low places. That can attach itself to anyone, right? And so to be able to um, choose to do something beyond positive, right? One of the greatest things I think, you know, I'm thinking about things from a, a spiritual platform and I'm saying to myself, you know, on the one hand, you have people who my experience is America, but around the world, who they don't really care that you have a camera on filming them, right? In America, we see this all the time with, you know, defunding polices and, and so forth like that. But in the world, it reminds me in the, a verse in the Quran that says, what's the matter with you? Do they think that no one sees them? That that is one of the most scariest truths to reckon with because we don't have any examples of that, right? That example, when, when, we are sh when we finally wake up into that truth, that hawk, we will never be able to go back. We will want to be good. We would want to, you know, I mean, I'm thinking about perhaps maybe one of the final scenes. Um, Avi is there and, you know, um, Yusuf is saying, hey, listen, you know me. I live right there, right? Yeah. Just prior to that, he tells his daughter, don't worry about it. We'll go back and get it another time or tomorrow. Like, this is their tract in life. This is what they have to do. This is, this is the lemon or lemons that they've been given, you know? But to, to finally be able to be seen and for that to have a ripple into the future, that future being shown by that child walking through the checkpoint on the same side as the Jews. <laughs> not waiting, right? Not waiting to, be, to get permission. Not waiting for permission is important because we see, all, we see that as well, right? We see Yusuf and his daughter, he's, they're, they're waiting at the checkpoint after they have the refrigerator. They're waiting. They didn't even... You know, we, in America, we would say, hey, excuse me, I'm here to, but they're waiting f to be seen, to be recognized, right? Because perhaps it's against the law, man-made law, right? Mm -hmm. And as soon as they are seen, we don't even know how long they've been standing there, right? But 
we get the idea that they've been standing there for a while because there's no subtitles. There's there's a conversation that's being had. And then finally they look up and they see Yusuf and his daughter there and the the yeah. the the oppression begins again. I, I want to kind of interject there, beautiful Yusuf, and, and, and you see, you see it all in, in this film. For me, it's like the title of, of the film that Ava did for your story, Now They See Us. Yes. Now They See Us. Yes. And I got to tell you, um, I am an optimist. I have to be an optimist. And this is how I forge forward with everything I do. I'm alive. And as James Baldwin said, I have to be an op optimist. Otherwise, uh, you know, my life is, uh, is an academic matter. Um, I receive messages from people all the time saying exactly that, now they see us. This is something I get a lot, those lines, I feel seen. Um, and also so, so many people just reaching out and um, people who didn't really understand uh, what's going on. And the funny thing is to me, I think to myself, but this is one little bit. This is one little cog in the much bigger control system and, and, and occupation and apartheid. It's one little bit. And it's yet resonated so, so, so much with, with, with people. And you realize that that's the beauty of it in the sense that this is the PG version. This is the PG version. This is, this is not, I mean, Really, if we want to go extreme into what happens at these checkpoints, we can talk about women giving birth and losing their babies or losing their own lives. We can talk about people dying at these checkpoints because they can't make it to a doctor or a hospital or being shot at these checkpoints and so on and so on. But that's not necessary. The PG version is so absurd and so simple and so basic and so relatable that it is resonating with people like I said, far and far and wide. And I wish I could share all the messages that we receive with, with, with everybody. And even more so, Salah, you know, I send you all sorts of things. But I mean, it's been phenomenal. And then I think about even the, the, the media attention that the film has gotten. Uh, just before this, an hour ago, I was on BBC News Live. Um, talking about this film, talking about the substance of this film, not just, oh, you want a BAFTA. People are interested. There is an intrigue. There is a, a desire to know and understand, but one has to find the, 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 the medium to, to engage. Um, and uh, so for me, I'm, I'm an optimist. I feel like these conversations I'm having and everything are are, are, are fantastic and that we are in a zeitgeist of a world wanting an end to, to, to discrimination. So, 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 so Farah, to, to try and say how this resonated, uh, again, I'm just gonna have part of humor, part of real is, I got a group who's already telling me, let's go on a campaign buying refrigerators for Palestinians. <laughs> Literally, this, this is kind of half joking, half <laughs> real. But, but I want to make a point because I have a personal experience in it as well that is very meaningful to me, is the whole thing rotate, revolves around these 18-year-olds, 19-year-old kids that are probably at these Israeli soldiers at the checkpoints that are probably doing their military service. I think that, that's what kind of, you know, these are not uh, adults, these are kids. And somehow you got to kind of like understand their psyche. Any 18-year-old, has power now. They control the lives of all these people. There's some uh, elated feeling, like, you know, people join gangs for doing stuff, people do what, because now they kind of, we're part of this and we have to see what we can do. And I think there's a lot of that that Israel is allowing to continue, which is essentially continues that humiliation of the elderly and, and, and the grown ups that come in and in front of their kids. And that is the personal experience that, I, that I've had. Actually, I've, I went to Israel once and I was taking my two younger daughters and with their cousin. And it was to me, it was their first, it was my very first. And it was theirs for sure, because we've you know, grown up as thinking that, you know, Palestinian mother and we want to be visiting Palestine. We go to the jo Jordan and then we cross the Alembi River where the checkpoints, the borderline is. And I've got our American passports that I present 
to to this young lady who was at the passport and I asked if you don't mind, uh, could you please not stamp our passports because we will be traveling to other countries. And uh, I've been told that they can actually stamp on the piece of paper, then they take it on the way out. So it doesn't go on your passport. She had our four passports, American passport in hand. Literally, she took them and flung them all the way to the end of the hall. She said, if you don't want to get an Israeli passport, go back. So when I hear in the film, there's that lady coming with her baby coming in and that, that's immediately the response. You don't like it, go back. You know, that's the arrogance that these little kids, the 18 year olds now have, it's power. And when you have that power and allowed to have that power, and this is what Israel is allowing, that over power that is causing this terrible humiliation. And then when she tells him, you know, she soiled herself, she wet her pants and she says, dad, I'm sorry. And, and that says, why didn't you tell me? And I mean, that response that's dad, there's nothing you could do. And that's exactly the sensation I felt. I felt my kids, like I'm like nobody. That little 18 year old kid could do that to me. And I shut up and take it. And I said, I'm sorry. I go pick my passports and came back. So it, it, it's, that is the type of experience that, and, and this is not these, this film, the Americans view, and they think this is happening at a border checkpoint. There's a hundred checkpoints all over the place. And I think, uh, you know, th these are not other than the flying checkpoints that impact the lives of each and every Palestinian every day. Hmm. Um, Yusuf right. and, and Farah and Mohammed, of course, what you said, I, I've been through that, I've seen it. But to answer Salah's comment, yes, the Palestinians have almost given up believing that others are going to help them. It's been 60 years. Um, but this film was not made for them. This film was made for those outside who knew nothing about what the Palestinians are going through. And the fact that the film got to the BAFTAs and is at the Oscars starts opening people's minds. I'm going to give you an interesting experience. I was behind the making of Passion of Christ with Mel Gibson. He couldn't get it made. And I stepped to the, because as a Muslim, I said, it's my duty. That film was released in the Arab world. It's the first time ever, you know, under tradition, you don't show prophets. So Jesus is the most important prophet in the Quran. And therefore, I didn't think it would get released. The Palestinians that's interesting, Saleh. There were still some theaters in 2004 when the film was released. It was all over the Arab world. And Arafat and the PLO saw the movie and they made a big press release saying, we are like Jesus. What Jesus has gone through of the occupation and violence that, we, that he 2,000 years went through this is who we are. It was very strong. I never thought they would connect Passion of Christ. So that was important for the Palestinians. But today, Salah, the only way you're going to get the Palestinian people to believe that things will change is the way the blacks in South Africa believed that they would get their freedom when the world boycotted South Africa. And everything that was done to help South Africa with Mandela in jail and then out of jail, they finally got their freedom. I don't know how long it's going to take, but the more the world wakes up with little things like this movie and today social media. Yes, you're right. There are no theaters uh, Saleh, in, in not only in Palestine, but also in Tunisia and Algeria, in Libya and Afghanistan. There are no movie theaters, but there's social media. Thank God for that. Then there's a ba the bad thing about social media, which I read last night an article that the Chilean government wants to introduce in the constitution. Think about this, guys. In the constitution, an article about protecting the future brains of the generations of young Chileans from the poison of social media. Quite interesting. I don't know how they're going to do that. 
But the fact that they're going to put it in the Constitution, how are we going to protect our youth from all of this coming from outside when we cannot talk to our youth? In the case of the Palestinian Saleh, this movie, if it's on YouTube, everywhere, and little by little in schools, professors, executives, politicians, the Israelis will not move unless there's pressure. They're not going to move just because they're generous. It's an occupation. The way South Africa was an apartheid, and it'll take a while. And I know I've been in this Palestinian problem for myself 40 years trying to do something, and we haven't made any progress. And when the PLO came to Tunisia in 1982, I was there. I, we, we funded them, the families. We try and, and then they went back when 93 Oslo, and unfortunately nothing happened since. You are right to be discouraged, not you necessarily, Salah, but your brothers in Palestine. But we have to believe in the optimism of Farah and of uh, Yusuf saying even a small thing uh, gets that across. Um, if this movie wins an Oscar, it won a BAFTA, all of a sudden they're going to say, the present, what's that about? Oh my God, I didn't know this is happening today. Little by little, people are going to realize that it's not about not having work, occupation, like Yusuf said. You know, it's really being colonized. I come from a country that yeah. obtained freedom, not through violence, from the French. As you all know, North Africa was colonized by the French, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. I come from a family that fought that and obtained independence. The Algerians did later and the Moroccans with us. It took a long time, but what Israel is doing is a colonization. It's not just an occupation. A colonization means exactly that. Second class citizens, right? And yes, you are right. The 18 year old uh, border guards, uh, Mohammed, our brother Yusuf can tell you how the young African-Americans are treated by young white policemen. You know, all any young, any young man, white or non-white, that puts a uniform, I don't know why, the uniform makes them automatically either fascist or certainly aggressive. Whether he's a custom <laughs> official, whether he's yeah. on the French streets, an Italian, Something about human beings and costumes. They put it on, it's they go crazy, right? The uniform, so, the uniform is tricky. <laughs> oh my god! Um, so yes, uh, it is a problem. But Israel has to and to respond, Farah. Democracies start as democracies, and then they become dictatorship or ethnocracies. Originally, uh, Israel it was a democracy, or at least pretended to be. And now that you have second class citizens, but unfortunately, if we have to wait a hundred years, we won't be around, but we know the demographics, there won't be in Israel. So you know, Tarek, let's um, I just wanted, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just want to make no, sure no, I finished. Time to get questions from people because um, there's quite yeah. a few questions. Um, and I wanted to say for you out there listening, if you can, I know you all are putting some questions in the chat box. If you can put them in the Q&A box, because I, there's so much stuff in the chat, it's kind of hard to go through there. If you can put them in the Q&A box. Um, one of the questions is, um, Farah, where did you find this wonderful little girl? She's fantastic. Yes, Maryam Kenj is, is, the, is the young girl. And uh, you know, long story short, I, I knew her aunt um, and she's a friend of mine. I had cast Saleh Bekri and I was visiting her and I said to her, I've got to find a young girl around eight years old and she needs to act, she needs to speak Arabic. And ideally, you know, just not a very tall order, look like Saleh Bekri. And, you know, Saleh has these brilliant blue eyes. It's not easy to find someone who would look necessarily like him. Um, and she said, what about my niece? I said, what do you mean, what about your niece? She showed me a picture and I, my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe it. She, she was perfect aesthetically. I said, does she speak Arabic? She said, like a grandma. I said, can she act? She goes, I think so. I don't know, but you know, meet her. And she said, but she's a, a wonderful, confident girl. So I, I, I met her in Nazareth. I went to see her as, you know, and I had other work to do, of course. I fell in love with her. 
Um, she is such an intelligent young girl, emotionally intelligent. She is, she is confident and, you know, I don't need to explain, you've seen her in the film. Uh, she's a natural. Um, and uh, that's it, my gut knew I had found my Yasmin and she was the first one I met, but I felt foolish. You know, really, is this, is this, is this perfect? So I went off and auditioned a few more kids and, and just went right back to her, you know, right back to her. So she's, she's, she's not a trained actress at all, but again, world conspiring, her father was actually on board to be the production designer a manager on, on, on our set, complete coincidence as well. And, um, and so she had been on sets before, she just never properly acted or anything. And, um, and Saleh can tell you now, he, he also is, knew her and knows her family. Yes, I, I got to know uh, Nael and uh, Layla before they got married. We used to, to meet in Nazareth and we, you know, we were friends, we still are. And then they got married and they have three children. And by coincidence, I didn't know Farah would, would cast Mariam. She, when she told me I was very happy. And then when I met Mariam as an actress for the first time, it's, she's, she's, she was amazing. And she was there and living every moment. And this is the most important to live the moment and to believe you are there and to, to, to feel you are believing you are there, to feel you are believing that this is your father. And that happened, just happened like, uh, like magic. Uh, and, sorry, I don't know if I cut you off. Um, Mohana, this is part of, this is my question combined with another question from someone who's watching. So can you talk a little bit about um, your background with the former Weinstein company? And then if you can, if you don't want to, that's okay. But um, I just wanna know why, why this film? Like why, you know, you, you, you are involved in many productions. Why with this production? And then if you can talk about either Farah or Mohanan, what it was, what, and this is a question from the viewers, what were some of the challenges of dealing with the Israeli government in getting this film made? I'll give a quick answer and let Farah answer that, that, that uh, interesting question. Essentially, I had seen, uh, Farah had done three short movies prior. She's done the Oceans of Injustice, and I do, and I please, they're all available on Farah uh, Nabulsi's website. Uh, the Oceans of Injustice, she did Today They Took My Son, and The Nightmare of Gaza. And those were, I mean, when I watched those and I had a chance to, to, to get to know Farah more during that period, it, it's exactly what Tarak was talking about. It's, it's you feel the passion and you feel what, what uh, the creativity that goes into making those films. And I hope people will get the chance to view these. Uh, uh, they didn't get the acknowledgement because I think Farah was, was doing them for her uh, satisfaction and, and, and telling that, those stories that she wants to tell. So to me, when I saw those films, it was necessary. And I had those experiences that I, I described earlier. Uh, I felt this is the kind of film that needs to be supported and, and, the, and I did that role in, in the great work that, that Farah does. Um, yeah, just to clarify. So those were adaptations of things I'd written and I produced them. I did not direct them. And they were more portrait, more tone poem, um, more experimental. Me getting to know my identity, you know, as, as a human being, a filmmaker, and of course, telling the Palestinian stories that I wanted to tell, but very, very different to the present. Um, and to your question, um, what, what, I, what, what kind of... Uh, permits and kind of uh, process with Israel. I did not communicate or have any interaction whatsoever with the Israeli government whatsoever, zero. I didn't want to and I didn't need to. We were in the West Bank, the 22% of what remains of historical Palestine, the other 78% being Israel. Um, uh, uh, you know, that the became Israel through ethnic cleansing and, and dispossession and all of that. So we're in the 22% of which consists of the West Bank and Gaza. 
And in the city centers, if we needed permits, it was with the Palestinian municipalities. Um, the, the one area where one would have said, ooh, where did you get a permit from and how was checkpoint 300. Uh, I did not seek permission from anybody. Uh, philosophically, I refuse to. You know, who, who do you go to, to, to request permission to, to, to film such a thing? Um, so, it, it, you know, that was that. And, and, and we, we filmed, we filmed. I mean, you've got to remember there is other, other filming that is taking place in the West Bank, whether it's for some Palestinian comedy show, whether it's for, you know, um, and as I mentioned earlier, we were just intelligent where we where we shot, and we we got permissions from the, the Palestinian municipality when when needed, um, and and even the help at one point from the policemen to stop traffic, um, you know, and and that was it, that was it. Uh, here's a question: um, a brilliant idea, uh, but how exactly did the idea of a fridge come up as the gift? A simple, a simple question, but really one on everyone's mind, I think. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, it, 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 it was a choice, a symbolic choice for me. The, the real conversation I had with a Palestinian very near his checkpoint where the seed of this story was laid was actually about a couch. There was a turnstile and a metal detector. And I said to my friend, if you needed a new couch, what do you do? And, you know, it was the concept of if it doesn't fit, it doesn't go and so on. So when I, when, I, when I was kind of coming up with the story, I thought, my God, okay, a couch, put that aside. A fridge is, is sustenance. It's, it's, it's where you keep your food fresh. It's how you keep your family essentially alive. I mean, ultimately, if we're talking about men in Palestine, um, it's not to say that women don't work and all of that, but if we're going with a cultural angle, every man is, is trying to sustain his family against the odds uh, in, in the most stressful and strainful circumstance. And uh, as, as we know, I say circumstance, of course, I'm talking about occupation and apartheid. Um, and so for me, the fridge was just symbolic of that. And if a man cannot sustain his family, if a man cannot bring home something that keeps food on the table, oh my God, like what, what are we talking about here? What are we really talking about here? Um, so yeah, that was, that was the choice. And interestingly enough, I had sat with Basim Tamimi in, in, in Berlin. So he's the father of Ahed Tamimi, who I don't know if everybody knows. She's this brilliant woman, young, young or old teenager, who ended up uh, being taken to prison for, for slapping a, an Israeli soldier. So I was chatting with Basim in his home. And he was telling me, and there's a checkpoint, literally at, at the entrance of the village. And he's telling me the number of times I've come home with food, milk, yogurt, meat. And then he's held up at the checkpoint for hours. So when he gets home, he throws it out. And I just, again, so simple, so basic, things we take for granted. So for me, fridge, food, sustenance, it, it's, yeah, it symbolizes every man's struggle in many ways. Yusuf, did you say something you were muted? I don't know if you. <clears throat> I, I just was saying, wow, you know, I remember, and, and the reason why it, it, it's such a pronouncement to me is because I remember I was talking to my wife once and I said, you know, in Islam, um, when you realize that the whole of your life is worship, it becomes worship because what you do and your because of what you know, right? And so even in that concept, when you go out to, you know, find food for your family, you've just done, you just worshiped God, you know? You, you participated in what it is that you're supposed to do. And here it is, in this particular instance, we see a version that we can all relate to by this refrigerator, right? It's like, how big, how small can you make a refrigerator? Here's a refrigerator that needs to be the replacement for what's already there. And yet, because it can't go through these narrow, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about that juxtaposition of this narrow space when you just saw earlier in the day and every day, all day, 
people being allowed because of their, you know, who they are um, to drive freely, perhaps put it in a van and take it home and have have delivery like we have in America, right? Oh, when is it going to be here? Between <laughs> nine and nine. <laughs> Give you some kind of outrageous time where you have to just wait at home, you know. But here in this particular instance, it's like the the basic necessity. We're going to oppress you even in that. Mm, yeah. The daughter, the daughter having to use the bathroom and knowing that she had to wait for her father. Mm. You know, the childhood, the 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 the, the innocence being stripped and taken. Right. All of that stuff. It's like the dehumanization of a people similar to what they had done in, in, in Vietnam. I remember, you know, watching footage of Muhammad Ali talk about, you know, why he was not going there. And he said, if you want me to fight, I can fight here. I can fight you. <laughs> like You're my poser. You know, you want me to fight these people. But I, I kept listening to the language that he was given. And part of the language that was being used was this term that they were giving the people in the term, unless they were called the child of God was demoralizing and causing this person to imagine, right? We talked earlier about the concept of, of a uniform and the beauty of the uniform is that it was, it was described as a costume, right? And I think about what they talk about in America, where they say absolute power corrupts absolutely, mm -hmm. right? You have to you have to look at the sacredness of what you've been given, right? And utilize that sacredness in a very intentional way, right? Questioning yourself, interrogating yourself. Am I doing this for the greater pleasure or am I doing this for myself? And if I'm doing this for myself, what happens as I do it for myself, right? And there's a challenge in that because everything that you should do should be for the greater pleasure of the creator to basically magnify the fact that you've been given this opportunity, even whatever little bit it is, right? You've been given this opportunity and you have to take it and make it into what it needs to be. And and if I may just interject there for the I mean we talk about children of God, Yusuf is saying that this is the the irony of the conflict that we have. It is my I have a lot of Jewish friends and Jewish partners, and they are the best people I know. And they stand for causes for justice and for humanity and they do the most amazing works. It amazes me that this is being done in the name of a religion. Actually this people, I mean the settlers is now the extremists, as we had the Muslim extremists. This is the, uh, these these are taking. This is running the show, and it's unfortunate that we allow this to continue in the name of religion, where humanity should step in and allow this injustice and and and, and to continue. I also I, I want to add something as well, um, which is exactly the, everything you just said. Yusuf speaks to this idea of why the PG version. Um, the only occasional criticism I had from a few Palestinians because. Generally, Palestinians from inside Palestine have sent me most wonderful things. I've just read a couple of comments where I was asked, why, why didn't you show, you know, the really kind of extreme version of, of what's happening at these checkpoints and so forth, and it, it was too light. And it was just this idea of actually, no, when we talk about that basic element of a fridge and sustenance, a girl wanting to go to the bathroom, again, all such normal parts of daily life. If you're not allowed to do that as a human being, don't worry about the births at the checkpoint. And the, the, those are, these are crimes. These are, these are war crimes. They're crimes against humanity. But, but, but at the basic, basic level of, of bringing a fridge home or fresh food or being able to let your child just use a bathroom or hail a cab or order something to your house, you know. So it, it, it's really in the simplicity that the impact is to be had. Um, yeah. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time, or we have run out of time. But 
I want to say thank you so much. This has been an excellent conversation about a beautiful film. Um, I am so excited about the Oscar potential, but I'm just excited that it is out there. And I'm looking at all the comments that are coming in. I do a lot of these. I moderate a lot of these panels. Far there is over a hundred comments in here telling you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you to you and all of you for being involved in this conversation. And um, thank you. Uh, Sue, uh, I would like to connect with Yusuf uh, on, on more to come in our common. Can you share our emails and numbers so that I can connect with Yusuf? Yusuf, you're in New York, correct? In Atlanta. In Atlanta. Yeah. Well, we open American Skin in Atlanta, as you know, on Martha Luther King Day. And we wanted to do a premiere, but the COVID uh, stopped mm -hmm. it. But mm -hmm. I, I need to sit with you. We have some common battles to fight still. Absolutely. Inshallah, inshallah. thank you so much. Um, Raima, please stop recording. Um, we still have an audience. So I just want to make sure that everybody knows that we have an audience still. But if, Raima, if you can stop recording, that'd be great.